Great. Welcome, everybody. I hope uh, all of you have found a way to tune in to, to this webinar. You are warmly welcome. My name is Kieran Long. I'm the director of Arctes, the National Center for Architecture and Design here in Stockholm, Sweden. And I'm joined by a, a fantastic panel today to talk about the Raw Engen project, um, a program of art and architecture which is really unique here in Sweden and we think has extraordinary lessons and extraordinary potential for urban development even beyond. And although we're sorry we're not welcoming many of you there in Lund today, it's also an opportunity to spread the word more broadly and invite many of you from wherever you are in the world to contribute to this discussion. Um, I'm going to do a brief introduction and of course the main part of this event is a discussion with our fantastic panel. There's an opportunity for everybody watching to ask questions and I'd encourage you to use the chat for that. I'll come to that towards the end of this session and try to take two or three of the best questions um, then. So use the chat if anything occurs to you as, as we're talking. Really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Um, but once again, you're warmly welcome. And before I go into an introduction of what Raw Engen is, I'd briefly like to um, introduce the participants um, in the panel today. Um, in order on my screen, we have uh, Nathan Coley, um, a Scottish artist here from the UK. Welcome, Nathan. Hi, good morning. Thanks for joining us. We have, uh, we have Ricardo and Eva um, from Flores and Prats Architects um, in Barcelona. Welcome, Ricardo and Eva. Hi, hello, Hi. thank you. And Gia Brendeland from Brendeland and Christopherson from Norway. Hi, Gia. You're black at the moment on the screen, but I'm sure you're with us. Yeah, I will try to fix it. I don't know exactly why, but I will try to fix it. Yeah. We've got a few minutes. Gia did say earlier on that it's extremely dark in Norway right now, so maybe it's just the season. We'll have to, <laughs> um, but we're hopefully getting back um, sometime soon. Um, so we're here to talk, if I could have the, uh, the slideshow on the screen, please. Um, we're here to talk about Raw Engen, um, which is a part of the of a large scale urban development project um, in Brunshög on the outskirts of Lund in southern Sweden. Um, Lund is a is a university town. It's a cathedral town. It's a very historic place, an affluent place, a place with tremendous pressure for development. Um, I think we're just are we seeing the slideshow now? I hope that the audience is seeing it. I can't see it, but um, so uh, yeah. So and and this and the project will in the future um, be a master plan for for hundreds of new homes, homes that Sweden desperately needs. Sweden is in, in the middle of a house building boom um, and uh, has a has a housing shortage nationally. Um, so this contributes to that national agenda, but in many other ways, it's a kind of unique um, a unique process, at least to this point. Um, Raw Engen, you see the site in this slide here, and the crest of the cathedral, who is, of course, the main client for this project, and we will come back to that theme, of course, a very important, distinctive aspect of the, of the Raw Engen project is the, is the client group um, being represented by the cathedral. I'm trying to move this on now. Um, here you see a diagram um, of, of the site What's striking about this uh, diagram, I think it's a very beautifully drawn map, um, I guess designed by graphic designers Holster Green, which shows some of the main kind of monuments that are there on the site now. Um, what of course, it, it's a little bit euphemistic in, a, in that all of the gaps between these, these large scale and um, figurative and representational uh, buildings and, and aspects of this landscape will be filled in by housing in the future. Um, it's a bit like a guide to a kind of archaeological site, this map, somehow. It shows the, some of the interventions that we've already had on the site at Roy Engen, but also on the left, the gigantic circle of the Mark IV particle accelerator, um, just one of the presences around the site of, of the university and research culture, which is so strong in Lund. It's interesting, if you look up Mark IV particle accelerator's mission statement, they say, we make the invisible visible. And it's striking that in, uh, in Sweden, it's scientists who think they do that. For me, it's artists who do that. And I think it's interesting maybe to talk about this question of making the invisible visible in the context of the works of architecture and art that have happened so far on Roy Engen by the three fantastic practitioners we have with us today. 
This is the site as it is today, just a word on the word raw engen. I haven't discussed this with, with white architects, but raw engen for, for non-Swedish speakers, an eng is a field, a, a meadow, if you like, usually characterized by nat natural um, plant life and so on. And a raw, of course, means is the etymological root of the English word raw, as in unfinished or rough, but it's also a kind of fairy, a kind of sprite. Or, and and this, this idea of um, enchantment seems to be something that the projects, the three projects we're going to see um, have in common. It's a slightly enchanted place, this, um, despite its um, apparent emptiness. These beautiful photographs show the kind of um, uh, uh, farming land character of much of the site wide open, big skies of Southern Sweden. Um, perhaps the, before we come to, to Nathan's work, perhaps the decisive difference, as I mentioned, between Brunshög, um, Raw Engen and, and other similar urban development projects in Sweden is the presence of the cathedral in the project, an institution, of course, with roots in the 12th century um, and with a very different view on, on time, on value, and on what um, timescale one might need to make a profit out of a piece of land. And perhaps, and what I learned from white architects, perhaps it is their influence that has allowed a space to be created for three projects that ask questions and raise questions about what a place should be, how we make a place that was that is at the moment no place, that's an open, empty uh, piece of land. Um, and that's a question I'd like to um, pose to all three of the, the practitioners we have with us, but that, that the cathedral spirit and agency and even the questioning of their, their uh, presence is, present, is somehow identifiable in all the projects I think you're going to see. Nathan's work, um, Nathan Coley's work for, for Roeng, and where the, he's made two separate works um, for the project, and they began um, Roeng, and they're the first two interventions of the, of the four works we're going to talk about today. Um, Nathan is an artist who makes some works like this, or a series of works that deal with text, deal with found phrases, and placing them in context where they start a conversation with a building, with a place, with a public. Um, and this heaven is a place where nothing ever happens was a phrase put up in lights and placed outside or opposite the cathedral in Lund's center. So not at Brunsberg, not at Roingen, but in the center of the city to begin to signal that something is happening, to signal the cathedral's um, role, perhaps, as, a, as an actor in the future of Lund. Heaven is a place where nothing ever happens. We'll, we'll ask Nathan what, what his uh, intentions were with the work, but of course, it's a, it's a lyric from a Talking Heads song, um, and has indeed started uh, um, a, a conversation in the city, or did start a conversation in 2017 in the city about the role of religion, a role of spirituality, the role of the cathedral in the city. Um, there's a film online you can see where some young people or people, citizens have learned talking about the work and thinking about the questions it raises. Nathan's second work um, was completed in 2018, a year later then, and is called And We Are Everywhere. It's a sculpture that took place at the site um, of Raw Engen, um, but it's a, in a way a sculpture of a building, a mysterious presence that appeared in 2018 next to a road that cuts its way through the, the site. Um, and of course, again, started to raise questions um, raise about what the site would be in the future. What is this work? We, again, we'll, we'll pose that question to Nathan himself, but of course it uses a language of, of architecture that's perhaps more familiar to us, mostly from newspapers and from news online about refugee camps, about the kinds of um, temporary buildings and, and rather, um, uh, yeah, uh, the, the character of architecture that uses found materials to just try to instate some kind of presence on a site, either temporarily, and this was of course the temporary project, but it wasn't a building as such because you couldn't go into it, nothing happened there or inside it. And of course, perhaps the most mysterious of all are these three crosses that adorn the, the roof of the sculpture, signaling, of course, a relationship with religious buildings, but calling into quite, but in strong contrast with the kind of symbolism of a Gothic cathedral. I think we have another view of, the, of Nathan's work. And the kind of materiality of that, both from the site and also of the kind of um, uh, found materials of, a, of, of an industrial society. So 
The most recent work completed at Roengen is by the Norwegian architects Brendeland and Christofferson, and it's called Hage. Hage is a public garden for Roengen. It's the first permanent uh, structure built um, on the site. And you can see here that it consists of a, a very beautifully engineered and elegant core steel canopy with a large table underneath it and a brick wall that encloses a garden. Um, this will be a structure that will remain in place as the community around it, around it grows and as housing is built and other buildings is built, it's hoped that this will take on um, different meanings as time progresses. There's a very interesting notion, I think, for Brenda Leonard Christofferson to come and propose a kind of empty place, a space for meeting, but a space without an explicit program. Um, there's, there's also things that, it, that architecturally, of course, one can't avoid thinking about when you look at it, um, not least this elegant pavilion, which seems to be some sort of portico or canopy or moment of entrance into another world. It certainly reminds me the heavy set roof of, of even the work of Mies van der Rohe. Um, but in the background, this beautiful garden wall, of course, can't help, can't help but remind us of a cloister garden or a market garden or even a medicinal garden, the kind of thing a monastery might have or even a cathedral. And it's already become a place for community meetings, for meetings about the future of the site, but also for more casual encounters, birthday parties and, and festive occasions, which I think the architects and, and, the, and the people behind Roeng and Hope will continue um, into the future. A shot at night. And then Flores and Pratt's proposal for the project, which is not yet um, being built, I think. It's not yet complete, of course. Um, is the first building or larger scale building on the site. Um, it consists of two separate buildings, a timber tower and a lower building, which will establish the corner of a future city block. Um, the two buildings sit right next to Hage, um, the, the garden designed by Brendan and Christofferson, and will provide apartments as well as community spaces, kitchen, bakery, workshops, and a library. Um, so while it is now the start of the housing development that will come, it's also thought of as a, as a social space. The wonderful hand drawings of, of Flores and Pratts, I'd love to ask them about in a second, which rare we see it in a Swedish context, um, hand drawings for, for any kind of uh, building proposal. And here you start to see the relationship between the, the high building on the left, the tower building, the lower building on the right, and just behind the tower building, you can see in this section drawing, um, is Brenda Linda Christofferson's um, Hage building. There you see in the model. Again, very hard for me to not start to imagine a relationship between a cloister garden and a tower having some kind of relationship with, with a cathedral. Um, but this is perhaps thematically something we can come back to. So forgive my very fast um, introduction of these, these three very rich projects. Um, I'd like to invite in now all of the practitioners for discussion. Perhaps we can have them on the screen. Um, and begin, if it's okay, with a question to you, Nathan. Um, one of the questions I think we want to talk about with everybody today is what it's like to work in a place that is not yet a place or a place that is, is at the beginning of becoming something very different. Um, for you as an artist, when you were invited in, how, how did you think about answering that question? Uh, good morning. Um, for me, the, the, the thing that was a given, there was two things. One was the the prescribed location, the site, which uh, as much as the images look as if nothing happens there, uh, it's cultivated landscape. So it's actually, it's industry, it's, um, it's um, food produce. Um, although the owner of the land is, uh, is unknown, I think to most people that pass by. So the fact that, the, that Lund Cathedral owned this land and had done for for many years, hundreds of years actually, of course, was kind of fascinating to me. Um, and then the undeniable fact that the, that the institution were the patrons of, of the commission. So this takes the position of the artist right back to, to, to history in terms of being, uh, working with faith and manifesting their beliefs. So. Although it was new to me as a as as an artist, there's a long there's a long line of artists that have functioned in that way, um, and any religious organisation deals with metaphor and signifiers and illustrations of 
what their values are on a daily basis. So in a sense for me, thinking about other institutions that I was working at at the same time, I found Lund, Lund Cathedral very open, very um, uh, expansive in their, their way of talking to me as someone who could work with them. Um, and I found them uh, completely able to take risks in ways that more formal museums or commissioners wouldn't. And I think because of that, well, I think the reason for that, or one of the reasons was that they have, they have faith, they have undeniable belief that they, are, they as an institution will endure. And I, I found that absolutely liberating. We could that argue that, that that's an Achilles heel as well, but I think that's, that yeah. was liberating. Is that a situation you've been in before? I mean, your work has touched on questions of faith, of course, before. Is, is, have you ever worked for a church? And what, what, were the, what were the conversations like when you proposed your quite pro potentially provocative phrase for the first yeah. work? I don't know if I would agree that I was working for them. Uh, I don't think I was working for the church. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I guess scholars would, would look at my work as touching how belief manifests itself, politics social dynamics, the built environment. So I'm familiar with these subjects. Um, I found, I found their sense that, uh, you know, talking about the land, the, the, the brief that they'd set themselves or the conversation was that they would develop the land with the values of the church. Now I found that absolutely fascinating. We spent an hour trying to identify what those values were which was interesting in itself, but um, I don't think there's many people who are developing land anywhere in the world that are that those are the values and the, the thing that preoccupies them. So in a sense, looking at the photographs that you showed that the site looked empty, I, I felt it looked charged. And I think the presence of the church being the patron and the owner of the land was a really strong fixed and defined starting point for me to think about how would I react to that? How would I somehow occupy that space yeah. and be the first person to make that kind of discussion available to, to the audience? So when you came to the actual site then to propose the second of your works, um, and we are everywhere, how did you choose the location for that? What, what were the things that you reacted to physically with the site that started to bring out some of those hidden meanings, the fact that this is not no place, um, as, it, as, as I may have described it? Yeah, own. I think I wanted to... I think I wanted to... I think I wanted to build something rather than... Uh, rather than transport something. So for me, the presence and the, the idea of it being made there, almost that that was part of the kind of performance was important. Uh, I wanted it to be visible from the road. So I had this idea that people would commute in and out of Lund. I wanted to make something that over time would perhaps become invisible due to its presence being there constantly. Um, there was no point in taking on the architecture of, of the, the environment around me because it's too vast and quite alien. Um, and then I guess I just brought my kind of internal discussion and my interest in terms of I mean, very simply just how people occupy land, how people build, what that means as a, an illustration of who they are, where they are and what they believe in whether that's religious or political or social. And I guess looking back now, I wanted to somehow make a connection with the cathedral in the middle of Lund and my object, my sculpture in Brunshog on the edge of the city. And what do you think then it left? I mean, do you now see it having affected the way that people think about that site or, or and, and when you see your colleagues works here, I mean, do they make sense to you in terms of the reading of the site you were trying to make um, back in 2018? Uh, I think that's a really difficult question. I mean, I was very conscious that I was first. I was the kind of pathfinder. I don't necessarily think I was comfortable with that. Um, we would need to ask the others if they found it easier working after me or whether that was a hindrance. Um, 
I wanted to make something which wasn't performative, that you couldn't go into, you couldn't occupy. It wasn't an invitation to live there. It was something which had a surface and had a scale and had a materiality, all the things that sculpture has. I wanted it to be a, a kind of signifier of intent, perhaps. But yeah, I also wanted it to be a little bit uncomfortable in terms of, in terms of a kind of unquestioning, liberal, social, comfortable dialogue about making things better. And I just very simply illustrated something which is really shit for a lot of people. That's a fascinating theme. I'm sure we're going to come back to it. Also, the, the challenge here in Sweden of, of, of talking about anything that might not be getting better. That might, that, uh, perhaps that's the theme we can come back to. Gia, I'd like to come to you as the, as the person who took over the baton, if you like, um, but also had to tackle the question of how you make a permanent structure for the first time in, in this formerly arable land. How did you respond to the place and to a, um, to a place that doesn't exist, if you like, with, with your work? Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's interesting. It depends a little bit on which scale you see it, because in many ways, we saw the site also as kind of outskirt of a European city. So in a way that's a kind of situation, kind of suburban condition. So that was part of the site. So this kind of conflict of scale with a, with a particular accelerator, with this kind of new developments, there's a motorway. Uh, there are all these things, there are power lines, but then there's also this uh, ancient landscape. So this conflict between these two conditions were, were quite important. Um, so in many ways, it's this kind of uh, really, really beautiful ancient landscape with this kind of almost like Tarkovsky character or, or just kind of a horizon, if you like. And then uh, the other part is this, the new or the suburban is creeping in. Um, so it was, a conflicting site and we were also interested in of course the history uh, the, the let's say the the operations and the production that has taken part uh, or taken place in this site so so all these things were part of the discussion and then if you look really really closely it's of course filled with uh, with uh, happenings there's a vast sky there are trees uh, if you look at the maps, you would also, and that was quite important for us, the, 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 the historical farm places in Skåne is approximately the same size as Hagen. Yeah, so, okay. so there's kind of typology also for settlements. I see so, we have a point actually. Could we bring the slides back? It would be much better to see the work maybe while, while we're listening to Gear talk, um, I now realize. Thanks for the person in the audience who made that point. Um, sorry, yeah, you were saying, so it's interesting, it's not a type that I thought of, but it relates in scale also to the, to the, um, to the scale of farmhouses in that area. Yeah, or well, actually farmsteads, so groups of buildings would have somewhere 50 by 50, 40 by 40, these kind of sizes. Yeah. But, but it's just one of many, many, uh, let's say when, when we work, there's so many kind of, let's say, observations and things floating around that and suddenly it just all comes together so there's actually not really one word to describe exactly what happens when it comes together because the the idea of the project is also uh, based on observation of Lun itself so so actually very much of the discussions about the interior garden the wall and things like that are fragments of things that you can find in this historical center of Lund. And for us, maybe that was the most important uh, discussion. Uh, how to make a connection between what is the historical center and, and what will be the new development. Should there be some kind of connection and how could that be done in a not very, let's say figurative and mm -hmm banal way, but, but more like a fragment of the historical city that arrived uh, on the site. And that fragment could actually strike a tone or kind of uh, create a, uh, a start of the, uh, the new development. 
I wanted so, to, uh, sorry, go on. Yeah. No, 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 that's fine. I was going to ask you, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the idea of the walled garden, because it's uh, obviously a figure that perhaps is one of the most ancient in the whole history of architecture, either in the Islamic world or in the Roman world, or, or later, of course, the cloister yeah. garden. And it seems in marked contrast to Nathan's kind of temporary, rather sort of, um, you know, an expression of, a, of an architecture that's really on the edge of being there at all. The walled garden is an ideal figure, a, a kind of um, something that, seems to have deep continuities. I mean, what, what did it mean for you? I mean, what, were you, what was most in your mind about making a walled garden in the middle of this open landscape? Yeah, no, it's, uh, I guess when you run a practice, uh, you have some ongoing discussions. So you have some discussions connected directly to a specific project. And then there's some kind of long, conversation so maybe conversation is better than discussion so especially me and Olaf have this practice where we would talk about certain motives and things that we see and experience together so so for us it's uh, it's actually an ongoing conversation um, there are a lot of projects like this uh, and it's the idea of the public space and the idea of enclosure and um, I think we, we've been discussing somehow the project for probably 10, 15 years, uh, but we never had the opportunity to, or certainly the, the project where this idea was possible materialized. So there's a kind of a longer conversation. But <clears throat> first it's uh, maybe more important than the wall was uh, the importance of, um, the garden or the public space mm. so actually the void and that has to do with for instance uh, central park or uh, the greek uh, agora in a way so the, it's a very very basic idea of urban planning i mean it's one of the oldest ideas as you point out and and for us that the idea of the, the urban space was very important so for you, it's a kind of void in the urban fabric more than perhaps even more than a, a, a cloistered garden. Um, yeah. Tell me a bit about the, about the canopy and this extraordinary table. Um, where did that come from? Because I think one of the other questions I want to talk about is the lack of brief or the lack of a very clear brief. How, was, was this something that you brought, this idea of a place for gathering? Mm. Uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, uh, it was a brief. And the brief was quite fantastic in a way that uh, we, we understood actually the description of what what drawing in was to be about as the brief. Uh, so there was an intention. Uh, and we were asked actually, I guess, to make somehow more of a, a temporary installation, more like a pavilion. And we were also asked to make a public space. And from that, we, we started to discuss and we had the idea to make something instead really, really permanent that could actually be a starting point. Um, then the, the form of the project came really quickly. Uh, so that maybe is based on, uh, we were walking around Lund, we were discussing and we had some ideas from before and there are just these kind of things that come together in a very short period of time. So we had the idea of the roof. Um, but then uh, the important point is actually when the, we start working and we get the engineers, Tim Lucas and uh, Ian from Price and Myers in London and together with them, it's possible to develop this idea of the, uh, how, how this could be built. So actually the, the way to build it, the use of cotton steel and rivets, and as we can see from this photo, also this very, very skinny uh, construction, uh, that, that is really a part of process, which is not possible only by architects, but it's actually the collaboration between Tim Lucas and his team and us. So, so that, that's, uh, that's part of, uh, so somehow that part is not really talked so much about, but that is a very, very important part of the project. Yeah. And, and just briefly, the, what do you hope then that this space will establish in the coming couple of years mm. 
that answers that question, what will Roy Engen be about, that you, that you found so exciting in the brief? No, we, uh, we, we discussed the, so, um, the British architectural critic and architect, uh, Philip Christo, um, or his practices in London, uh, described the kind of piece of urban infrastructure, kind of, which I found really, really interesting way of describing it. So actually, it's kind of part of city that might become very useful, useful in the future. So we have uh, playgrounds, or we might have a parking garage. We have described certain objects that we need in a city. And maybe we need uh, some kind of new type of public spaces when we plan new cities. So, uh, so I found that observation really fruitful. And I think that's, that's up to people to decide exactly what it will be. Uh, we see maybe what we've done more as kind of framework or infrastructure in a way. Um, but it would require active participation from, from the public. Um, and of course, it's also then a first movement and uh, Ricardo and Eva's uh, fantastic now second movement also puts the first movement into to motion, actually. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'd like to come to Ricardo and Eva now with, with the same uh, question. Welcome again. Um, we'll switch to your images. This, this question of how to establish with architecture, through architectural means, a place where there has been no place, or at least a, a very significant change um, in, in the status and, and activities that happen in this place. How, how did you tackle it? Because your, your buildings really are architecture. I mean, they're, they're buildings that must be part of a long-term master plan. Uh, what, what was your starting point to answering that question and establishing some kind of sense of place here in Roingen? Yes, thank you, Kieran. I mean, it's very interesting for us to be in this meeting today. It's the first time the three of us are together. And we have met Gail, but we haven't met Nathan yet. So it's very interesting because in a way, it's the way that we were approached and to this uh, project, you know, through talking with the cathedral and with White in different meetings. And when we jumped in, it was like in this stage. So there was kind of a, a history already that a little bit like a legend or something that has been there, the sign of, of uh, Nathan near the cathedral then this kind of refugees or uh, something that was really inquietante, uh, intriguing, uh, that was there once, but was not there anymore. So there was already a past that had gone that I think made the project very interesting. And then there was a present. The present time was a uh, Gail and Olaf uh, uh, project that was already there. We haven't seen it. And it's interesting also how you jump or how you are invited into this uh, project kind of conversation that all the information is not, the main points are given to you, but not all the details. You little by little you discover, you get to know more drawings. And it's true that for us, we understood that the, the new neighborhood had a, like a first stone being built at the moment that we were called into this uh, team. And this first stone was a garden. So we found it, as you said, it's something very ancient, but also something very um, sophisticated that has its origin on when we, part of the civilization became uh, not nomad anymore, no? established in a place. So it really focuses the origin of a place in a very delicate way. We knew the cathedral was behind it. So we thought they will take care of it and for sure I think they have built a new responsible responsibility for them to take care and now they are going into a program of different activities in it. I think our first reaction was very much the, the drawing that we see now in the screen and it was okay how we can start organizing or helping to organize some activities that will work with Hage and Hage has a big table but we we'll, also thought, okay, there will be another big table indoor, and then we can help in producing food, bread, or whatever, probably Hage won't have a kitchen inside. It's more about growing, and then the process of food can happen probably nearby um, with these openings that can open and you can go from the oven to Hage very easily. So this was our first thought of how to help activating this space in a, in a more, mar much more, uh, 
um, fixed, it's not temporary, temporary, no. You're, uh, yeah. Permanent, sorry, in a permanent time, because Hage will be more through the seasons, we will have all these changes and probably the oven, you know, will be the oven all year long and producing different kinds of foods. But we thought about this. So the, the first thoughts are about this connection with what we knew what was going to be built, but there were no images. There were images of a wall being laid down and mm. the bricks were coming from an old farm. So there was all a game of, of well, a game or a, yes, a, a willing to work with material and thoughts that have been previous to you and how you handle them. So we thought it was this idea of the process and working with time and giving importance to everything that happens before things are built, that we found the project is very uh, attractive you know, as, a, as a project. It's, a, it's beautiful to, to really to give the time to thought and uh, to participation, so there are a lot of conversations that I make this. Sorry, we have this fantastic, beautiful drawing here of, um, of the relationship between your work and Hager on the ground floor. But what about the, the scale of these buildings? I mean, this is a tall building. It, it, it's a marker also in the landscape in a broader um, way. T tell us a bit about um, what role these buildings play in, in this future town. Well, the, 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 the decision of the higher building has to do, of course, with the, this view on a distance or of being a landmark or orientation element in the distance. It's a place which is very horizontal that you will arrive from, the, from town, you go out from town and you arrive to this place. And the upper part is transparent. It will be like a lantern or kind of a, a place where it would be lighted to orientate you probably in the long nights of winter when you arrive home. For a while, it will be a place that that guides and also a place that in the time will be kind of a center of a, uh, of a, of a broader neighborhood, of a neighborhood. So the, the vertical condition of this, of, this, of this element, of this building has to do with, uh, with a, mar a mark in the place. And the other one, of course, is the beginning of, uh, of something that will continue uh, behind or on the sides. And the back part that we see in, in, the, in the picture has to do with the backyard conditions of these buildings. So these buildings, in our opinion, might have a, a facade towards the um, more civic square and a back, a back facade towards a more landscape condition with back, backyards and activities that has to do with working and, um, and, and workshops and activities that could be related to production. So the two buildings together create a public space as well that, that is, for us is a, has a strong dialogue with Hagi because it has a similar size, but has another condition of, as a public space. If Hagi is a place perhaps more like a delicate, delicate uh, condition of being um, a place for, for reflection, for perhaps for, uh, you know, uh, being there uh, in, in, a, in a quiet space, perhaps, then the, the other one has to do with, with more crossing between doors and doors and shops and bikes and skates and other things that perhaps doesn't, does not happen inside the hack. And then this, the, then this public space relates with the, with the forest that is behind in this photo we don't see, but it's in the other side of the corner building. So you have the forest and hag and and these two buildings, in a way, create this door or this relationship between Hagi and the, and the forest, between the, if you want, the, 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 um, the more wild, if you want, uh, mm -hmm. nature and the more, and the more uh, domesticated nature, which is uh, the Hagi situation. Yeah. So the public space uh, that these two buildings create are, are, are connecting these two walls. And, um, and for us, the scale of this, door, if you want, between corner and the tower was the key, the crucial thing to define because the, the, this, the size, this proportion is very, should be very urban already, even if, the, even if the people is not there yet. So we should create the dimensions of the future town. So the height of the corner building it has, it's a height that when the, when the place will grow, it will, in our opinion, we should not be uh, too low or too, you know, um, too, yeah, uh, too, uh, you know, too, too simple, you know, too should, modest, yeah. yeah, too modest, that's right. If you have the charge of a, a city that will be a part of the city that could be strong and already a neighborhood. So 
the dimensions speak about the distant future in a, in a way, yeah. as well as the tower is, is talking about uh, of, of today of a relationship of a, of a landscape which is empty. I think it's really striking listening to all of you speak how you've, you've found such richness in a context um, that perhaps to a regular property developer or something might might not be considered, they may, um, it might be hard to find that time. We have a question from somebody in the audience talking about slowness and, and perhaps the slowness of this process or the space that's created for the kind of conversations you're trying to have. I, I wanted to sort of uh, open up the conversation between you a bit with, with a bit of, you know, how important is that space for artists, architects to work with a degree of freedom or a degree of, um, with, with perhaps a little less pressure. I don't know if it's quite the same for you, Ricardo and Eva, because you're building a real building. I'm sure it has a real time scale. Um, but but what's the, um, what's the, what happens when we can create that, that space for a different kind of discussion? And, and how have you used that here? Because it's, it's so untypical here in Sweden, at least, to create a space for open questions. Um, I, I wonder if there's any of you who would like to comment a bit on, on the space that's been created here for a different kind of reflection. Uh, Nathan, I'll, yeah. I'll jump in. Um, I think the issue of, of time, slowness or, or, or fastness, you know, time is both of those, I think is relevant. Um, I think the, in one of the meetings, the, the, the gathering in, in the committee room of the cathedral, we're talking about that the, the kind of um, development time scale was 200 years. I mean, that's unbelievable that, that such, such quiet confidence that this will endure longer than us. It's both liberating and arguably quite frightening that you, the consequences of your creative action will be there for such a length of time. I, I feel very comfortable with the fact that my sculpture was, uh, was temporary and I think Although it doesn't exist anymore, it's undeniable that it occupied that piece of land for a year and a half, and that the the connotations of it, um, the echo of it, is still there somewhere. So, um, I mean, for you, for you, Nathan, when you're involved in a project which eventually will be a large-scale urban development project, is there any concern that your work will kind of be a cultural lipstick on a on a on a gigantic peak of some description. I mean, I, I have faith in this project, but you three are, are leading a conversation that looks fantastic. It's rich and, and meaningful about the, the, this place and what it can be. But is there any concern you think, well, you have no control over what this ends up being? The market could change, they could sell the site. I mean, what's... Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think also my other lasting, you know, it's been nice being invited today and coming back to the project. Um, I feel in some respects quite distant to it. But um, the undeniable fact is that the owners of the land and the developers of the land are a religious institution. That's, that's at the front and quietly in the back of everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. And I think that's utterly fascinating. And it makes me kind of reflect on how, how all three of the, the reactions to that have been in some way uh, use that as a material or as a as a as a as a situation which is which is a constant. Um, it makes me also reflect on had the institution been of a different faith, if it was the mosque of mm -hmm. Lund who were who owned the land and commissioned the three of us, would we have reacted differently? Was it if it was a, a new religious cult that nobody really knew who they were and what they were, would it be embraced with this new town get planning permission when it was relatively unknown what the what the endeavor was i think all those things have to be considered as being important it's interesting to speculate about what what would it have been like if there had been crescents on top of your work and not crosses especially in contemporary sweden there are tensions around mosque building and and so on that, that are very much political questions but yeah you have your hand up i'd love to ask you the same thing from an architecture perspective no uh, yeah it's um I think incredible to have um, what what has been incredible with uh, the project is to to be able to have time to react. And I just want to say to to Nathan because like 
<clears throat> his work, uh, We Are Everywhere. So I didn't see the first one, but We Are Everywhere, I actually did see. And it was just absolutely stunning. And for me personally, that, that was the moment when I really, really realized what kind of project you were part of. So, so, so that the intention and the seriousness and the willing to, to, to really, really support an idea all the way. So, so, so the work itself was so moving to see also uh, actually built exactly uh, according to your uh, replica or the model, the maquette, and, and then executed in, in that kind of way. So there's precision to this project, which is, uh, is absolutely fantastic. Um, so that, at that point, that was really quite something to, to, to understand that, okay, this is process, I mean. Um, so one thing about the project is actually what will be built on Roingen, but actually the other part of the project, which is just as important and maybe more important is actually how it actually uh, uh, will uh, contribute to the, the, the general debate. And I think uh, we should not forget white architects contribution here because that, that is actually the framework. That is the, the bigger framework of the project which white and the church has set up. So, so actually, how do we, dis what do we do and how can we work strategically when we plan our cities and places? And why do they often fail so spectacularly? And could we do something different? So, so, and and key component there is conversation and and of course time, um, time to react and time to think. And One thing that um, that Jake and uh, Jake Ford from White Architects and Jess Fernie, who's the curator involved in, I think, um, getting all of you involved in this project, said to me was that they asked the architects uh, the same question they would have asked an artist. Um, Ricardo and Eva, I wonder if you felt that that was the case or what, what was the difference here in terms of the question you were being asked and, and what kind of space did it give you um, into, as, as a practitioner? How does it relate to your own way of working? Uh, yeah, well, no, I was thinking about the previous, yeah, when you were talking about the time that uh, the cathedral um, is having for, is giving to all of us to think and reflect on the, on the project. I thought for us, this was um, a crucial, a crucial part of the brief because um, besides the, 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 you know, the necessity or the need to grow on with new you know, housing and uh, was this, this wish of creating a community uh, that for us was very important because it was, the, was uh, how to, to be in a place or to form a place that in the future will be a neighborhood, a place where people will feel like they belong to a community. And which is this community, which is formed by who? Um, who who's going to, to be inhabit those houses? Who's going to move there? It's going to only to be houses. It's going to be, for us, it was important that there was some produ production also there, some, some things going on besides living there. So they, they, all these questions came in. And for us, it was an extremely rich process, process because we could think that this, uh, this is an open, uh, an open brief that we could really uh, discuss and still argue and still uh, reflect on uh, who are we trying to incorporate and who, and because it's going, it's, it's growing from zero, it's growing from new. Everyone who's coming there is building up in the future. So if you incorporate, if you think in incorporating um, minorities or people which is not always incorporated in, in, in the city developments. Is, uh, I would think that is is more possible because the the people there are other other people who will come. They are also new in the place. They are not already in the place. So it's easier for everyone to integrate a, a community that will build a future place. Um, so all these questions are um, having reached us the, the uh, for for drawing because you see in the project there also is all this kind of very high low uh, ground floor level of one, two, le two floors that for us are, as we, we could call it like transparent in the sense and that are belong to everyone. Uh, they, they, they are able, to, everyone is able to participate in those places, work there, be in the library, be in the shops, be, 
being part of the communities. So you don't need to necessarily to be living there to be part of the place. So all these questions, all these possibilities, um, talking to the cathedral in, in such an open way allowed us to incorporate in a very, in a very um, yeah, uh, uh, direct and, and uh, intense or radical way. Yes. I'm, uh, I'm struck by um, how all of you talk about the context so much, but here in Sweden it is quite rare to have three uh, practitioners from overseas working on, on a project like this. I'm really grateful for, for, the, for the framework that White and, and, of course, the Cathedral have created. But how have you seen the, the reactions to your works? I mean, maybe, Nathan, yours is the most obvious, where, where you, you put something in the public realm. What, what did you learn about the Swedish context from putting those works here and, and, and the kinds of conversations about civic values, about the future of their city that people wanted to have? Um, yeah, I have a, what I think is a, an interesting observation on that. I mean, I guess you're kind of asking me, how, how do I reflect on how, what was the public's response to my intervention? Um, and that's a question about did it did it succeed in terms of what my intentions were? And um, there's a bit of me feels there's a bit of me feels that I was really um, in a small way disappointed. I mean, this is maybe not what people want to hear, but um, that I definitely want to hear this. Yeah, <laughs> that the reaction was that there was no reaction. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that means that the project was either a failure or, or a success. I think, I think the silence was deafening and was a valid response to my sculpture in the landscape. And I wouldn't profess to know why that was the case, but I think that is cultural and political and um, says something about the nature of Swedish society that one could maybe perhaps say that it opened up a discussion which nobody was willing to happen, to have. Um, and by I say no reaction, I mean absolutely no press coverage, absolutely <laughs> no photograph reproduced, no, no discourse. Uh, and I, I, I want to stress again that I don't see that as meaning that the the project for me or for the for anyone else was a failure. I think it just was something. Um, does that surprise you? I think what's interesting it's interesting we're all for an all non Swedes here talking about Sweden, but I, I am a Swedish citizen now, so I can claim some kinship. It's, we've just made a big exhibition about Sigurd Leverance, the great Swedish architect, who also perhaps is a little bit in this category, talking about things which rational mid 20th century Swedish culture finds difficult, like shopping and death and God and uh, top, big topics and, and trivial ones that, that actually aren't in the welfare state model. And I wonder whether any of the rest of you, it's also the institutions that you see on the map around all of your works, particle accelerators, research institutes, knowledge centers. Um, these, are, these are the best of Sweden in a way, but it's a rational culture and engineering led culture. I wonder whether the kinds of conversations you're trying to have, and perhaps Brendan and Christopherson, perhaps, yeah, you, your work has something to say here. Such an archetypal, historic, you know, rich figure. Do you find people respond to its sort of metaphorical, referential aspects, or, or do you experience a similar silence to, to the one that Nathan experienced? Uh, no, I don't think there's silence. Uh, I think we, in that sense, seems to be fairly lucky. Um, but uh, for us, maybe it's also more, uh, yeah, there are a few things about working in Sweden. One is the, let's say, the benefit of misunderstanding. So intentionally sometimes misunderstanding. So we can read and read things a little bit wrong. <laughs> And, and, and that kind of misunderstanding, so uh, kind of observations of Lund, uh, at least I had been there before, but, but it's, uh, that, that's one, one part of it, that actually you come to somewhere else with the eyes of the outsider. But, but the more important aspect is maybe the way that we build 
um, uh, the way that we build uh, in Sweden and the way that we build in Norway. And, and to actually make a comment on the way that we build and plan and, and uh, think when we do new projects and plan the new city. So I think, think it's more reactions to that and yeah. actually trying to be a practice who can order craft and order um, our craftsmanship and, and enable reuse and, and, uh, and trying to, to enter the discussion and comment on the way that we build in Scandinavian societies today. So I think that was uh, just as important for us. So you're sort of getting at the, the gap somewhere between um, the, uh, well, I suppose what I'm trying to ask is, how do you find a space that, that includes the paradoxical um, and slightly more mysterious or unanswerable questions of establishing a piece of urban design, establishing a new piece of city in, in open land, um, mm. rather than the kind of um, yeah. positive, you know, we're going to make a better new world narrative that we hear so much in Sweden and we hear so much, I guess, across Scandinavia. Uh, in that sense, uh, Sweden is, of course, quite similar also to what we have here in Norway. So there's kind of, uh, um, Let's say when we discuss urban planning, there's a tendency to, to focus really much on process and we become expert at discussing process, but we are not really good at discussing results. So what will it be like? What will it, how do we make a process that enables specifically or no, enables really, really strong results? And I think this project for me at least is, uh, is really interesting in that sense because it's a process that actually enables the creators to, to participate in a much more, uh, much stronger way, yeah. Ricardo so, and Eva, can I, can I ask you to, for any reflections? You're, you're building your building and designing it now, but what are your reflections on the cultural context you've entered into with this, um, with this work? I mean, you've talked about the context of raw Engen, but, but the Swedish construction industry, your client, how, how, does, it, how does it feel? Do you feel like you're... What kind of conversation do you, do you find? Well, we are now in a, we are having conversations mainly in the team, uh, in the working team. So it means uh, cathedral and wide. So our context is very open. And also you can feel that they, they call you, you know, from abroad to listen to you. So the way that they are so careful giving information so that you can uh, reflect with a much more open uh, perspective and kind of, uh, yes, go as far as you want with your ambition and come back to the conversation. So for us, it's a very open context. We had the chance of working in a kind of a similar context in here in Barcelona some years ago, building also uh, with other architects at the same time, evolving a new neighborhood for a city called Terrassa, 50 kilometers away from Barcelona. But probably what, what is more surprising for us is that working with the cathedral, in the conversation, there are some uh, spiritual concepts that are flying over the whole thing. Eh? And, and this is very, very surprising and really gives you this uh, support always, you know, when it comes to the economic phases and all this, not to lose the orientation that they, the cathedral really wants to, to build a culture for this place, not only houses, Probably our building now, or the moment that our project is now, is the, there will be housing there, but our concern now is how we will link all this common ground. Ricardo was saying that you know, other things can, will happen there, not only that you can go there for living, have your own house. But the interesting thing is that how we keep some of this uh, agriculture in the area that we think that already the Hage has fixed another way, another dimension to cultivate things, not the industrial one, but another size of cultivation. So how we, we kind of we reduce the scale of cultivation in the area that it can stay there, how we can connect with this. Um, here in the image, we see in Athens um, sculpture, and then behind there is this kind of cloud, shiny, not really shiny surface of Max 4, where the scientifics are kind of for us, you know, that we don't know what's going on there, kind of hidden, no? as you said, here, you know, making visible the invisible. So how can we connect with these uh, people also in the area? And we know that we're working with the cathedral, that is someone with a lot of agencies, so that 
uh, we are trying we are now at the moment of building these networks of uh, people that it's interest that might be interested in in coming to this area to mm -hmm. participate it won't be just a temporary invitation it's uh, someone who really wants to uh, start building the, the culture of the area yeah and i think this is the building the community that we are working for that we are willing for to, to yeah. be able to build with our project we have a few um, questions um, in the chat, so maybe we can scroll through and I can make sure that we pick up a couple of them. But briefly, Ricardo and Eva, there are a couple of questions just about the three, just about your proposal, the, the high building and its relationship to the to the landscape. Maybe you could quickly answer that while I look through the other the other questions. How how does it relate in terms of um, shading and and uh, you know all of that kind of? There's a couple of specific questions there. Uh, can can you can you read them because we can we can. Yeah, the uh, there, for instance, a question about how whether the whether Haga will be affected by the tall building next to it. What what you know in terms of light and in terms of uh, you know the the, uh, the experience of that landscape in the future. Yes, yeah, sure, it will be affected. And you know, working with models, uh, we were also seeing how it would cast the shadows in in Hage for a few hours in the day. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> We know that, but it will be also a sign of the density that is expected to grow in, in this area. And so it's true that uh, also by stepping into these um, lands, to somehow that I think it's um, there will be a density in the area. As Ricardo was saying, uh, the pieces of uh, the, that will be built, the buildings will have a, a scale of the future. So we think the shadow also is a sign of and yeah, there will be more shadows in the area, not that there's something that uh, is yeah. expected in the city. You, this, you see the, the sun going through your house all the time. Some At the moments. same time, it will trespass the houses, it will uh, cross them, um, uh, a window, big windows, and uh, it will enter into the houses. And that's also something that we want to attract, to get to a trap with the houses, big, big windows to get the landscape and the light inside. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a um, yeah, double way of seeing it, how you project shadow, but at the same time, how you capture the light into the, into the place that you're building there. Thank you. And uh, I think one of the most interesting questions here comes back to, again, to this question of time, but there's also a couple of comments, uh, Nathan, that there, was, there were some perhaps local reactions that perhaps didn't make it into the press that were positive and were engaged. It'd be interesting to dig a bit more into that. But one question here, could your work have stayed in place and endured alongside the other projects? I mean, of course, its expression is is temporary somehow. But um, Nathan, what would you would you have approached it differently if this was a permanent artwork? Would you how how might you have answered that question? I I, I think its strength is that it was uh, it was a fleeting image that I hope has stayed. Um, I would have, of course, made a completely different proposal and generated a different idea if it was going to be permanent. Um, I think my position as the artist is, 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 is different from, from everyone else. I, I always say that I think architecture is a dangerous profession. And I, I take my hat off to anyone who steps into that arena. And I think it's, I think it's, I think it's difficult and dangerous because um, the risks are, 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 are evident. If you make a mistake, it's a big mistake and you're, you're, you're occupying a, a position within society which is about making space and homes and your daily experience hopefully more interesting and better. And the, the responsibility is great that comes with doing that. So um, I think I'm operating in a very different dynamic and um, I don't know, maybe in 15 years time, we make it again. Yeah. When, when you look at that culture of architecture you're describing there, Nathan, what, do you, it's dangerous, of course, the risks are large, but do you think there's also, I mean, there's a different way of approaching a brief from an architect, you know, between uh, a radically different approach from an artist to an architect. I mean, do you think yeah. there's also a danger in the practices of the profession and the way that people think about um, architects think about placing things in a in a landscape like this one? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm much more interested in in why things look they do rather than than what they look like. Um, I'm interested in the fact that it was people from all over Europe who built Lund Cathedral rather than 
why it was and is the style that it's in. Um, I'm interested in the function of the walled garden in the community, much more so than the, the rivets of the canopy. As much as I uh, love the aesthetic and uh, I'm, I'm drawn by the elegance and the beauty of it. Um, so I guess that's the difference between how an artist would think or how I think and how an architect would. Um, one of the questions in the, the chat is about how do we how do we assess the success or the failure of the wider project? Well, I think two things, time will tell. And I think at the minute it's, it's enlightened and it's, uh, it's bold and it's, uh, it's well-funded and it's well-managed and um, it has every chance, every chance of, of uh, succeeding if, it's, if the structure is retained in terms of giving people creative space and time and money to do excellent things. So I long to see what it's going to look like and how it's going to feel. And I want to interview somebody who's lived there for 15 years and uh, agrees or disagrees with what we are all saying today. Maybe I could um, pose Jess, um, Jess Fernie. Thanks, Jess, for um, asking a question to you all, but to the two architecture practices first. She asked, what's, what, is, what are the fragile and radical elements of this? What's, what's valuable in the process or in, in the works you've been able to make um, that you think is something we should be trying to preserve in the process or is likely to fail or succeed? What do you think is um, likely to last or likely to have meaning long-term from this process? Long term, ah, <clears throat> well, you always, um, or I always uh, think that the process or the way that things are thought uh, have an impact in, 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 the, in, the, in the result of whatever happens. I like um, the way we work also, we are very, we have an affinity in, in this process that we get immersed into the project without knowing or without the, the emergency of a solution. So you go and you kind of get immersed in it and you think that things will come because observation is already project. So a lot of things and the project also is built with all the reflections that you listen from, from clients, from people of the area. So you get collecting things without not knowing precisely where it goes. So in this sense, we feel really uh, uh, like Comfortable, not comfortable, because you're never, but on uh, in the way that we approach things. So, so this is good and giving time to all this. And we, we, if we do this, is because, uh, or if this is the way we work, it's because we, we believe that the, at the end, what happens you know, reflects the, the conversation that had been through it. So I think the project will reflect when we kind of define it and formalize it we will formalize the conversation that we have been having. So if we are uh, aware of building this community on the ground floor, the community will be there, we will grow it. But first we have to, to build it previously through this conversation, finding the people, <clears throat> defining which kind of activities will, will facilitate there. So I think it's a project is a reflection of uh, everything you have been taking in account. That what, that's why things can be kind of more complex, even they have a semi, uh, um, kind of a simple uh, appearance, uh, but because they are embedded with all these uh, willings that you have had for the project. So I think it's good because in all this time we are kind of this, no? we are collecting willings for it. And the good thing is to draw them. If there are no willings, you are very short in drawing. No? The, the drawing moment of the defining moment is very short. You need a big bag of, uh, of reflections. Gia, can I, can I pass the, a similar question over to you and uh, somebody who's familiar with this, with the Nordic context at least, yeah. what, what, feels, what feels radical about this process? Yeah, um, the process in itself is uh, of course highly unusual because uh, they, just to be interviewed and actually asked about your ideas before you get the commission is a first for us as architectural practice. Uh, and we've been around now for 20 years. 
So we never experienced this before and uh, was absolutely liberating. So actually to start the project with a conversation about what could be the ideas and what could be your contribution. So, so actually the idea of curating is a, is a very radical one, not when it comes to art, but actually for, for architects that actually the idea is very central. And uh, obviously then to, to work with a client like the church that, that is based on ideas and, and faith and, and really to, to have that kind of conversation uh, uh, ongoing through the project. So, so there's kind of, um, it's not so much a discussion about uh, how to build that and how to do this, but it's, it's about the ideas. And I think also then, uh, I, I mean, our project is it's a very, very basic idea. It's a very simple idea. And our main concern was just to, to execute it really well. It, it's not uh, also not a very original idea in terms of, uh, yeah, it's just a public space, but but you need to do it properly. And uh, so so then actually the to discover that the client really listened to this and and really tried to do that in the best possible way was was uh, quite unusual. Uh, sorry for my camera. It's it's not so much to do about it. It keeps switching on and off. We see you sometime. We see yeah. you sometimes. It's okay. Sorry about we have just a few short minutes left. And there's an interesting, quite specific question about energy and food. Um, of course, food is a theme in both the productive landscape that you, you're making, Gia, and, and Ricardo and Eva and your building. How, how do your work, how, how do the, the works relate to this question of food? Um, could you expand a little bit on that? Yes, we are <clears throat> very interesting in, in, in keeping the, the production of vegetables in the area and how to scale down this uh, agriculture into a more kind of variated uh, gr growth, variety of uh, vegetables and fruits in the area. So, yeah, you have seen maybe in some pictures of the model, maybe if you can go through them, yeah. uh, there are some winter gardens in the area. We have been looking at examples very interesting around Stockholm, maybe you've been here and called, I pronounce it badly, but Rosendal. That it's like a new one. Uh, yeah, Rosendal's triggered, yeah. Yes. These images. So, yes, yeah, so these images in the section, you know, coming from the left, from the right hand, you can see, you know, there are artichokes there uh, growing, then something in the, also in the winter, in the winter garden. And then you go through some of the workshops that can be related to, to, yes, to, so this agriculture activity or a fab lab, more uh, sophisticated machines open to the public. And then you, we arrive into the basement of the tower. So this linked that, that you can produce the, the food and you can see the chimney you know, being with smoke, but it's interesting because the oven is working at this moment. So we're interested on in what we call uh, from land to table that can be you know, seen here. Of course, I think there is an issue for in Europe about not to still recognize what we eat, be able to I mean, cook. It, it feels extremely relevant. I mean, uh, cooking and, and uh, this kind of conversation is one of the most vibrant parts of Swedish culture, one could say right now, lots of innovative chefs and people trying to grow, um, grow locally. So it's really exciting to see that. Is there, are there chefs and people in mind? Do you have collaborators yet who are going to make this real or is it, uh, is it yeah, a concept at this stage? Cathedral is, is talking with some uh, people that might be interested and well, explaining the project mainly. But yeah, there's uh, people also in the School of Agro Agronomy in Lund, the treasurer of the of Cathedral's treasure, Mats Pedersen, is himself uh, an agronomist and he has worked the land. So, so he's very keen on so He really agrees with uh, keeping the, this richness. As we know the soil here is incredibly rich. So, so what we will do with it? Uh, so some part would, and also what's interesting in this care of the process, we imagine that uh, we ambition that while some buildings are built, also because there will be out of wood, there will be much more clean construction. So there will be agriculture around in the area, so that it won't be like a wasted land for a while, 
for the years to come waiting for something, but, but every step in this project will have its meaning. Now it has it with Hage alone there, and we have a little bit of buildings that will pop up. We hope that the activity of agriculture will be something very important to activate this ground floor. It's a richness that the area has. And so we're also discussing, you know, talking uh, with cathedral and white and how much we will be kept of it because it's, it's a treasure to cultivate next to your house. Yeah. But that's, um, in answer to the question we had that it's food is fundamental then to, to certainly your project. It's going to be fascinating to see how they are able to listen to, to this feedback and make, um, make the ground, give the ground its, its due value. Um, we're at quarter past one. I'd like to thank everybody who's been tuning in today. There's been a lot of you. I'm really grateful for that and for all of your fantastic um, questions. But most of all, I'd like to uh, just uh, wish thanks deeply to Nathan, to Ricardo and Neva, to Gia for, for their fantastic contributions today, but also really fantastic work. Sweden is lucky to have you. Um, looking forward to invite you all to the museum when, when COVID allows. Um, but that's the end of our event today. Thanks to everybody. Um, we'll see you soon again. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for the invitation. Thank you. Uh, for the conversation.